Well, good evening, folks. Hope everybody's doing well. Yes, we're going at it again. <laughs> so some of you probably are wondering, where the hell do I get all this energy to do this? I'm supposed to be 50 years old, right? <laughs> I don't sleep like the rest of you. That's the, that's the secret. So we're going to talk a little bit about market wizardry and everything else. If you've been in trading long enough to listen to folks talk about what books were influential to them, um, you probably heard Jack Swagger's books, Market Wizards and New Market Wizards and Unknown Market Wizards and a couple other things he's done. I can't remember the other titles, but in my opinion, the first two were the best. And I wasn't really all that impressed with the, the other ones after that. But I remember buying those books, going down to uh, Columbia, Maryland to go to this trader's library where we go in and buy our stuff, you know, our books and magazines and courses and shit. And I saw this first edition of Market Wizards there. And I'm thinking, Market Wizards. Hmm. Market Wizards. That's, that's, that sounds cool. That's going to teach me some real shit. Let me just get that book. So naturally, I was trying to keep it guarded until I got home. I didn't bother opening it up because I expected to see what? Graphs and charts and indicators and all kinds of alchemy with candlesticks and bar charts. Well, <laughs> when I got home, I opened it up. I hurried up and thumb through it. I didn't see any pictures, no graphs of any kind that made any kind of excitement for me. And I'm thinking, okay, well, they're just going to talk about it then. So I put it aside for a couple weeks, actually. Read other books that I had purchased. And then out of morbid curiosity and the fact that I spent the money on it, I grabbed it and started going through it. And I was actually intrigued to listen to these individuals talk about their experience, which is honestly where I am today as an educator. And I guess you can say a trading influencer that uh, I like to see how other traders think. I'm not really interested in what they use for their techniques of trading. I'm, I'm not all that terribly interested in that. Sometimes, depending upon the person or personality, I might ask a question or two just to get a feel for what it is that they're doing. What style of trading are they day traders, short term traders? You know, something to that effect. And while I enjoyed the book, Volume One and Two of Jack Swagger, you know, Market Wizards, and I think everybody should have it. You know, I'm not getting anything for saying it, but I, you know, I did a review on books that I felt were influential to me, and they inspired me. Some of the experiences that these investors had coming up, and they don't only really go into detail on how they trade, which is nice because it left it ambiguous. It left the reader wondering what wizardry they did. And because of that title of that book, it made me pursue knowledge that would otherwise be referred to as real market wizardry. And I was convinced as a young man that I could find that in indicators and applying different strategies and going in and trying to find strategies that worked well in specific areas and trying to improve upon what it is that they did. I wasted a lot of time trying to fix things that I knew were broken in other strategies and other approaches. And I coded different approaches to the classic indicators you're all aware of and use now today that I don't touch anymore. And I tinkered with everything trying to find my own little Harry Potter experiment, trying to find my own wand. And I found out that 
everything that I was trying to mess around with to do these superhuman feats of accuracy. See, that's one of the things that if you go through those books, like me, I was waited on bated breath, waiting for them to teach something that no one else would teach you, that you would never find anywhere else. Because they did an interview with this guy, Jack. He was he or they would divulge some secret concept or approach to getting in there and finding a secret move that no one else could do. And while each new interview, I was waiting for one of them to step forward and do that. At the end of the book, I forgot about it. Because I enjoyed the dialogue between Jack and these individuals talking about their experiences, some better than others. Obviously, there's a few of them in there that I wasn't really all impressed with, but everybody's going to have their own opinion about, you know, just like they have opinions about me and I have opinions about other people. You know, opinions are like everything else. Like, you know, everybody has it, but you know, it gives a shit, really. But at the end of the book, while I was thinking about how I enjoyed it, it got me thinking about how I went into the book with something else. Something else put me into that book. It was the title, Market Wizards. It was a great title, great title. And while it didn't deliver on my initial expectations as a trading book, even though, yes, I read the dust cover and it was interviews with traders that you know, did well in the industry, I was expecting just like some of you now, every time I do a video, you're expecting some new technique, some wizardry. And what I've learned over the years is that while I was a younger man expecting other people to share their secrets, their market wizardry, their price chart alchemy, they really didn't do it. They really didn't deliver any of that. They just talked about what everybody else talked about. And I was expecting someone to do a better job on spinning the retail stuff that everybody sees. And every time, every single time, a new book, a new course, a new something or other, it would be the same boring bullshit. Wouldn't get anything new from it at all. And then I started pursuing my own studies. And I started thinking to myself, okay, if, and think about this as I ask you this question, if you've never thought about it, think about it right now. If there really were market wizards, traders that were able to do things that were just a cut above everything else that you'd seen before. Something just really separates what they do from everything else. What would it look like? Well, I got to thinking when I was coming up, like a superpower. You know, my sons, you know, when they were growing up, and my youngest still, he's uh, a little bit slower. Than the average person and i mentioned he was harmed by a vaccine when he was born and while he's not terribly slow he's noticeably slower than the rest of my kids bright child very artistic very creative but he's slower academically and sometimes he still talks to me like a little kid and he'll ask me he'll say dad if you could be a superhero what superpowers would you pick it's almost like he forgets that he asks me, me this question. Every three or four months, he'll ask it, and I'll tell him, you know, something different because I know he's asked the question before, but I want to treat it like it's a new conversation and a new opportunity to, you know, broaden his opinion about what it is that we're talking about. So, because of that conversation with my youngest son, it made me think about this tonight and how I came up learning these things, developing these things, being inspired by how these markets really book price and 
really taking a step away from what everybody else and what I was introduced to, like everybody else is, you read the same stuff. Everybody looks at the same thing, the same books, the same strategies, the trend lines and all that stuff. And there are people out there that make money with that. Absolutely. But my opinion, and this is simply my opinion, it may differ with you and you may not agree with what I'm about to say. But just because someone makes a lot of money, I don't really think that makes them a market wizard. It makes them an extremely profitable trader. Absolutely. That's skill. That is absolute skill. There's no denying that. But I don't really see that as a market wizard. To me, that conjures up ideas of precision, accuracy, foresight, higher strike rate than the average trader. Knowing not to go in to areas where it's not likely to do well, where other traders that are extremely profitable, they'll take more losses because they're comfortable with taking losses and they're comfortable with coming out of drawdown. Whereas, in my opinion, a market wizard would be abstaining from that and knowing when not to do those things. So when I was... A younger man, I, I made a list of things that I wanted to really focus on. One of them, obviously, I mentioned this many times in, in passing. And if you're a new listener, I'll just toss it in here because you, know, you may not have heard it yet, but you probably will if you go through all the stuff that's on my YouTube channel. But one of the first mentors to me, and I've never met this man, so please don't bother him like other people have done. But uh, Larry Williams, I, I purchased everything that man put out. When I was a younger guy, whatever he did, I bought it. If he had an article that he did, uh, you know, wherever he did anything, I got it. He was like, he was like my Babe Ruth, you know, he was like my Rocky Marciano, my Muhammad Ali. He, he was the person that I aspired to be like. I wanted to be like him, not in the sense that everybody looked up to him because he took 10000 to $1.2 million in a year. But because he had tools that I felt were market wizardry. What tools am I talking about? Mostly what he has written in his book, How I Made a Million Dollars Trading Commodities Last Year. It's a 1970s book. But 75% of that book is still relevant today. I don't, I don't subscribe to the, the lunar phases and all that bullshit. But all the other stuff, the, the chapters that he dubs his million dollar tools they absolutely are ex exactly what they are titled if you're a commodity trader that stuff still works most of my understanding of what a mega trade is comes right out of that book and what i've done is i've heard him in his lectures and his keynote speakings and everything that he's ever talked about and taught on. And wherever that man said he had a difficulty overcoming this or he tried this, it didn't work for him. So therefore I used that. Well, if he couldn't do it, let me see if I can go in there and figure that out. Cause I've always been a person that loved puzzles Jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles, word searches. I, that's how my mind thinks. I'm, I'm extremely analytical and I'm obsessive. So if I hear someone say they have an issue and I have an affinity for them, my whole point of doing it was I'm going to fix this problem for them and I'm going to share it with them. And they're going to appreciate me because I've done it. That was my 20-year-old mentality going into most of what I was trying to do as an initial trader, trying to figure out these puzzles. And one of his lectures, he mentioned how it was a short-term trading. And I, I, would, I don't want to call it a workshop. He was standing up on like this stage and he was just talking to the traders and such and kind of like an auditorium event. And it was on the topic of short-term trading. And he mentioned how he had no real understanding 
how to figure out how to buy at the low on bullish days. He would always buy on strength. Most of everything he did, all of his trading systems were buying on strength, buying on strength. If it opens below the previous day's low and it rallies up 20% of the previous day's range, he's buying strength. Well, that's to me, that's chasing price. And that's why he has these really large stops, $2,500 per contract. That, to me, you know, that's, that's a lot. It's very forgiving when you are very confident that you think it's ultimately going to go a certain measure of handles or, or range. But I never felt comfortable with that. I tried very hard to use his mechanical systems and his rule-based ideas, and I just – I couldn't make none of that work. It didn't fit with me. And to me, it highlighted this need, this need to be a market wizard. I wanted to be with that title, Jack Swagger's book. I wanted to, I wanted to be that title in flesh. Now, I didn't tell everybody what I was trying to do. Because if I told everybody what I was trying to do, they would have told me that I'm wasting my time. And or they wouldn't even understand it because you know, most people, unless you are a trader, they all – everyone we tell when we say we're investing in trading, day trading, they, right away they know you, you're off your rocker. There's something different about you. You're eccentric. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying you're fucking nuts for wanting to risk your money like this. You have to be a special type of person to believe in yourself doing this and making money. The average person just can't do that. So you should feel good about yourself because you're cut from a different kind of cloth. And when I was younger, I knew that about myself. I knew even though I felt overwhelmed when I would blow my initial accounts and I was frustrated because I wanted to just work right away. I'd go back to my notes and think, okay, what, what is I'm trying to do? Where am I going to focus? And I wanted to come up with these approaches that would zero in on very specific turning points in the marketplace. Because I knew, because of my personal losing trades, my stop loss would many times be the very turning point in the market would go the other direction. And I'm thinking to myself, okay. If this is a net sum zero game, every loser, there's a winner on the other side of it. Okay. How on earth can I be using everything in these books, going from system to system, using everything? I followed these rules. I followed them. And they didn't deliver. So it made me wonder... If I'm this inconsistent as a new trader and I'm doing the same things over and over again, I need to come to a point where at the moment I feel like I need to be doing what these books tell me to do, I need to stop right then and there and flip the script. If I feel like I have to be a buyer based on that bullshit that I was looking at all those books and trying to utilize, stop. Look for what would exist at the opposite spectrum at that very moment. What signatures in price action would I see if I'm ready to take that trade, if I am committed emotionally and psychologically to follow the rule-based ideas that these retail concepts are supposedly teaching us? At the very moment that I have committed, that I'm about to take the trade, then I have to stop. Turn everything upside down, quite literally, and then look for what it is in the chart at that moment. And that is exactly what I was doing on America Online when people were watching me on that message board run up trade after trade after trade, calling everything in advance and Anybody that would have did trade for trade, everything I said, would have done $90,000 in one month without any pyramiding. And that's what got my attention, or that's what got everyone's attention, and started following me. 
like you're all following me now because you see me doing things with precision. Every single person that's came to me has come to me by way of seeing something I've done or you were shared a video of me executing on something. And you noticed that that's something different. That's different. Sure, people buy and sell. They make money. It's wonderful. But they're not doing these same laser-guided entry points, pyramiding and building up and building up and building up and going right to the same thing all the time. Targets filled, targets filled, targets filled. You're not seeing $15,000 max loss days in the same week multiple times. You're seeing levels, thought process, narrative, walking you through every individual candle, and the logic that it should deliver to. And it goes against everything that every book that I've ever purchased tells me. So I sat down. And the first thing I figured out was my power three. Larry Williams says he couldn't figure out how to buy below the opening price on bullish days. Nothing, nothing he had allowed him to do that. That's his words. Was he lying and he did it you know, surreptitiously in his personal trading? We got to take him at face value. He said he didn't. And that's what I did as a 20 year old. He says he didn't. So that was a personal challenge to me. I'm going to conquer that for him. He was my hero. I wanted to do that and say, here, look, here's my contribution for producing all this material who at the time as a young man, I felt like he did this just for me, like all the planets aligned. This was the answer to prayer, much like what all of you say about me. I was in awe of his works, his books, everything he did. I was not that impressed with his 10000 to $1.2 million. I was not impressed with that because I understand that that is absolutely nuts. That's not trading. That's gambling with charts. That's what that is. Anytime you are competing in a competition like that, the only thing you're showcasing is your ability to gamble. Now, if you want to have a competition where precision entries, lowest drawdown, accuracy, then absolutely, that's a trading competition. That's where world-class precision would shine. Because anybody can get lucky over leveraging accounts and doing dumb shit. If you've ever traded long enough with live funds, you probably experienced a run where you kept doing something too much. Too much leverage, too high of number of contracts or positions in Forex or shares in a stock. And you had this windfall victory and you think to yourself, shit, if I could just do that like every other day, <laughs> unrealistic, unrealistic expectations. So trading competitions, while they're wonderful. They're very entertaining. They're not really showcasing trading skill because anybody can over leverage on one windfall price run. And Larry Williams even said that about himself in 1987. He caught a good lick in the marketplace. That was his exact words. So I don't, I never looked at that and said that was an inspirational thing to me. I mean, I have to recognize it. It's the longest standing record in Robin's Cup. No one's ever come close to it. But I was more impressed with his tools, how he utilized open interest and how he looked for accumulation and distribution. And his accumulation distribution formula, while it worked a lot as a commodity trader, I saw it, it was there. It made me think about measuring accumulation and distribution. Whereas I never would have ever considered it had he never brought it up in his teachings. So it, it brought this insatiable desire for me to go in pursuing how to track these smart money traders. When I came up with smart money concepts, 
just like my name, Inner Circle Trader. Larry Williams as my initial mentor, and I call him my mentor because I subscribe to 90% of what he ever said. Now, I probably use about 4 to 3% of whatever he's used and taught in my own personal trading today. But you can see his fingerprints and his influence over me. And I have still a great deal of respect for him. I'm so thankful that he put his work out there. Because he could have just said, fuck all of you, and I'm making my money, and there it is. But it's a lot of money to be made when you're teaching. I've seen that. Lots of money. It's real, real easy money to do that. But you have to have something that's worth learning, <laughs> and you have to be able to show that it works. And that's one of the wonderful things I get to do with all of you. I show you real time. I call it live. I walk you through it minute by minute, and you see it. Every single day. But these tools where he had his inner circle workshop. Well, like I mentioned in Corb's interview, I've mentioned also in passing when I was on Baby Piss when they were asking me where to get a name from. That inner circle workshop, I was like, shit, I didn't, I didn't go to that workshop. I wish I could. But I'm going to be the inner circle trader. And now I am. Smart money concepts. Sounds cool, doesn't it? Well, that was inspired by that book written in 1970 by Larry Williams. His smart money tools. His smart money tools, open interest, accumulation distribution, commitment of traders, and premiums. Premiums in the sense that you're looking at the commodity market. And you're looking at a carrying normal carrying charge market where the contracts, for instance, like if you're looking at oil, okay, crude oil, you're looking at the nearby contract now, whatever it's trading at. We'll just say, I don't know because I'm not looking at oil. Let's say it's $100. And then the next contract in the future that would be traded when the nearby contract expires, it should be like uh, $102. It should be more money going in the future. But if it ever reverses, that is considered a premium. And it's an inversion of normal carrying charge market pricing for the delivery contract months for a futures contract. And that means there's a real high fevered pitch demand, real demand. So supply and demand does work in that asset class. There's a real supply and demand need for commodities. You need it. You need oil. You need gold. You need grains, you need meats, you need coffee. I don't drink it, it's horrible. But people, you know, they need to have that for their fix and caffeine and shit. So all of that is a real supply and demand asset class. It, you, you can measure real supply and demand there. You really can't measure real supply and demand with a share of stock or a currency. There's a synthetic approach to doing it, but it's not the same as seeing it with a market like a commodity market, grains, you know, real tangible things, grocery store items, basically, sugar, cocoa, coffee, orange juice, meats, you know, cattle, hogs. So I have a lot more tools and concepts than Mr. Williams introduced to the trading universe and community. But I absolutely subscribe to those that he taught because they are essentially how you can carve out the understanding of real supply and demand in the commodity markets. But I never felt like that was enough. I always wanted to do more. I wanted to over deliver and have an arsenal of weapons. One weapon that was good for when the market's going to reverse and go lower. One weapon that I wanted to use when it's going to reverse and go higher. One weapon when I'm going to trade in a trading range. One weapon when it's going to be an extremely hard, one-directional trending model. Very little retracements. And I set out to look for these things that would repeat over and over and over again. I paid so much money for old data charts and chart books and things, all kinds of statistical data 
on every market, everything, palladium, platinum, copper, oats, <laughs> granola, flaxseed. Those things are very, very thin as a commodity market, but I had all that shit because I was completely immersed in this. I lived in, well, obviously you can see me. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm with you every day, more times than I'm sure your own family members are. And I'm constantly pouring into you because I have a lot of shit to talk about this year. But I wanted to have what that book title suggested, Market Wizardry. I wanted to know that I knew that I knew. I wanted to know I had a tool for that. And you hear people say all the time, oh, it doesn't matter what the market's going to do. ICT is going to come off with some shit. And you know, he did this and did that. You're fucking right. <laughs> You're damn right. That's exactly what I've spent my entire fucking adult life doing. I got tech that you couldn't even fucking imagine. And I'm sharing it before it happens. Proving it. And you can't find it anywhere else as much as other people out there. You got $500,000, folks, okay? There's, I know there's a number of you listening right now. And people take it and they put it on YouTube. I'm going to pay $500,000. fucking thousand No, fuck that. It's $2.5 million now. $2.5 million fucking dollars. Everything that I'm teaching in this mentorship and everything that I taught in my core content, everything, okay? All the things. Find that shit with the exception of what I mentioned in Larry Williams, which is only three or four things, everything, find it somewhere else in anything written before 1996. Video format, film, or written. It has to be published before then. I'm going to tell you right now, the $2.5 million ain't never leaving my motherfucking hands because you can't find it. You cannot find it. It's not fucking rehashed. It's not relabeled. It's not renamed. It's not fucking twisted. It's not revamped. It's mine. And I'm proud of that. It's been entrusted to me. So when you look at books that talk about market wizardry, technical science, I, I coined that shit. <laughs> I coined that. You say there ain't no technical science. Well, boom, it is now. ICT's bringing that shit. Now think about it, folks. I asked you to contemplate on what it would look like if there was really market wizardry in trading, in speculation. What would it look like? Would it look like having a map of how the market would trade in the future, almost 75% of the time doing the same thing over and over again? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a seasonal tendency. More research. Okay, Steve Moore has the absolute fucking best, the best seasonal tendency work that's ever, ever been produced. Steve Moore is the highest pinnacle of seasonal tendency research, data, and resources. And what he sells is ridiculously underpriced. And he probably doesn't even know who the fuck I am. <laughs> but I've been repping his ass since I was first introduced to him in 1995. Anybody that's ever said anything about seasonal tendencies, unless it's coming from his work, they're absolutely full of fucking shit. Sorry. You might have your heroes and shit, but I'm telling you, there ain't nothing like that. What that man's put out and compiled. Unbelievable. Just beautiful, beautiful resource. Seasonal tendencies are a real fucking thing. Now, they're not going to work all the time. And books don't tell you when they're not going to work. So where did ICT go in there? <laughs> 
I want to know when they're not going to work. And by knowing that, I know when they're going to fucking work. Oh, shit. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what the fuck I did. So a market wizard would have what? A map. A map that leads to the forbidden zone. The inner circle where the average person's not permitted to step in. And angels feared to trot. Oh, ho. you're also going to imagine that a market wizard would have ways to determine the highest high and the lowest low for a week of trading. So, young ICT set out on a quest to figure out how to do that. And ICT was successful in that. And then he started to think, hey, you know what? There's this shit called floor pivots. Pivot numbers. You know, R1, R2, S1, S2, and the central pivot number. I spent a lot of time working with those numbers. And sometimes they work. Sometimes. But I wasn't happy with some fucking times. Okay? What if you went to work? You had perfect attendance. You had perfect fucking tenants. You did what you were told by your boss. Never started in fucking trouble. You put up with fucking Carl's bullshit every fucking day. But you don't get paid for every day of the week. Something happened. Your boss gets a case at the fucking ass and says, you know what? I just can't. I just can't pay you on Thursday. You know, you, yeah, but I need you to work. What the fuck? Are you going to are you going to still put up with that shit? No, no, you're not. And that's how I look at it with market analysis concepts. It's got to fucking make sense. Because listen, if there's real probabilities behind something, you should know when they're in favor and when they're not likely to be in favor. Now, that does not mean you're going to know with 100% strike rate that that's not possible. You're, you're human. I'm human. You're going to do something. You're going to have some kind of emotional charge behind it. Someone said something to you about it on, on the internet. Your concepts don't work. Okay. You're going to go out there and try to do what? You're trying to shove it right up their ass. So you really want to see that trade pan out and you're stalking it. You really want it to happen. Well, is that really trading clear headed? No. Absolutely not. So there's going to be this human element that's always introduced in trading. If you're depressed, like I mentioned this morning, if there's issues, that's going on in your personal life. That's going to influence your decision-making skills. It's going to make you lethargic or make you a little exaggerated and quick to make a move because you want to take that sting away from whatever's causing you depression and replace it with a feel-good lottery win. But you have to have a faith in understanding that what we do as a trader, there's something behind these catalysts, these triggers that cause us to get in a trade, to place a stop wherever we're going to place the stop, to risk as much as we're going to risk, and the target where we're expecting to see market trade to as an objective or a terminus. And largely, if you look at what we have put up with, with retail horseshit over the course of your career and mine, it's a lot of bullshit out there. It's a lot of bullshit. And think about how much you talked yourself into believing that nonsense. Hoping that it was going to take you out of your job. When you really had no fucking proof that that shit was going to work. It was just a whim, a hunch. Oh, it's a, a, a hope, a wishful prayer. Man, I hope these moving averages and animal patterns lead to me making money so I can get out of my job. I hope these Gartley patterns deliver these butterflies and bats. So I decided that I was going to spend my life pursuing real precision oriented things. And I wanted tools that would tell me when to do something and when not to do something. And it would not be ambiguous. So I sat out and looked for 
when the high of the week would form and when the low of the week would form and what days they would form. And where was I inspired by that? Larry Williams. He would have this thing called trading day of the month. Now, they weren't all that accurate, but the major turns, and let me, let me paint a picture for you. Imagine a seasonal tendency for the S&P and the bond market over the course of each individual month. So if you have trading days for the month, we'll say an average of 20 trading days, Monday through Friday, four weeks or whatever. And what the market typically did, he crunched the numbers and he, he spit out this data that said, by far and large, this is usually what the S&P and or the bond market would do for this month of the year. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh, shit, I'm going in there. And I, every single day, if it was a, a down tick on the line chart, that's basically what he was showing you, then I would sell short. And I got my ass handed to me. And then what I started doing was, and it really wasn't a smart thing to do. But I was impulsive, obviously, as a young man, and I was trying to make a lot of money real quick. But I noticed that the key turning point for each trading day of the month template that he produced and shared, if I just focused on the highest one when it was getting ready to go down, I was waiting for that one to occur. And then the next day, then I would look for the trade to go short. So I was using it as a confirmation, but it really inspired me to look for things that would tell me what? A roadmap, not only over a seasonal tendency that I get and have openly shared and told you, Steve Moore, for more research, you can Google him. His service is the absolute fucking bomb for seasonal tendencies. It is so good. I wish I could say more about it and to make you understand how good it, I've used this man's shit since 1995. There's never been anyone that came close to him and what he's done. His material and, and, and the work in seasonal tendencies is the highest degree. And I get absolutely nothing for saying it except for the fact that I'm so thankful that he didn't keep it to himself. And what he sells it for, dirt cheap. It's ridiculous. It's 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 crazy because he could sell it for a lot more. If the traders that looked at it knew how to utilize it, because the way he teaches it, in my opinion, um, it's not how I use it. But he talks about the best seasonal tendencies, kind of like filters it out for you. But that whole approach to thinking about seasonal tendencies like that. And then over the month, what does the S&P do for that particular month? Where's the main high and where does it usually go overall? If it's going to be a big down swing, the fifth day of the month, and it just keeps on going lower into the, the remainder of the month, that tells you it's going to be a really bearish month typically. And I'm not here trying to share or teach Larry Williams stuff. I mean, I don't know if you can Google it or find it anymore. But it was all part of his workshop. And that idea inspired me to go in looking for things that would give me an insight. And I literally scoured every fucking time frame on the S&P and on the bond market. I literally stripped those two markets down to ticks for years of data. I would have that shit in books, in spiral notebooks with me in my truck delivering candy bars and fucking tasty cakes, coffee and sodas and shit. And when I had one or two minutes sitting at a stoplight, that page was already open for me to start looking at shit again. I, I was a nut with it. I needed to constantly be a sponge. And every time I saw something, new ideas, new, no, I wouldn't say epiphanies because there was a lot of things that I thought I was being led to look into and they really didn't pan out. They were just dead ends. 
but over the course of 15 years, 18 years, most of what I have today that is who I am was derived from all of that shit, digging into things that really was an inspiration to be nothing like anyone else. Like I wanted, I wanted to be able to sit down with a Larry Williams, you know what I mean? And, and say, here's what I've done. And I will, I knew if I ever had an opportunity to see this man and I just have to tell my oldest son uh, yesterday, I said, he's in his eighties and shit. So he's old, but I would love to meet him, shake his hand and then show him what I have done and say, look, your shit's awesome. In the 1970s, I was fucking brilliant shit but look what the fuck i've done <laughs> look at this shit look at this this is nuts like how many times have you seen me call the high and the low of the day now granted i was off by a point today okay it happens i've already made concessions you know with that and told you hey look you know sometimes i'm off a little bit but i do this Day in, week out, month, year, everything. I've been doing this for years. Quietly, in my own little corner of the, the community as, as, uh, as traders, until I stepped out there, none of you knew me, and you didn't know this stuff was possible. If someone would have told you that you could forecast how the market's going to gravitate back to, think about those pivots. Okay, Think about the floor traders' pivot numbers. I've used them, and many times the market would just smoke them, go right on through, and don't. it's like they weren't even there. So what happened? People started doing what? Tinkering with it. Here's the version of uh, floor trader pivot numbers, this guy's version of it, and this guy. How many fucking floor pivot numbers do you need? It's the same one that's always been used by the floor traders when they were in the open out cry pits in the circle market tail chains and the C CBOT. It's the same fucking plain Jane pivot numbers, okay? What happens is, is people take something and they tinker and tinker and tinker and tinker because they want to leave a, a mark on the industry. They want to be worshipped. And I wasn't really interested in all that. So I had all these tools, I had all these weapons of mass destruction. And the only person I really was interested in sharing it with was Larry Williams. That was That was really what I was doing. I was building up this volume of work to say, look, this is what you fucking caused in my life. You inspired me to do these things. And I've never met him. And I know he's probably, I know he's heard about me because trolls and such have commented and told, you know, hey, ICT said you meant you mentored him. And he's been honest. Look, I've been honest. I've never met him in my life. I've never met him. But he has been like, I've never met none of you, but I'm your mentor. I've, I'm teaching. I'm actively teaching you. I, I couldn't recognize you in a group of people as a person that listens to me. But you know that you are a student of mine. And if you introduce yourself, hi, I'm so and so. I'm, I listen to your mentorship lecture work and, you know, this is what I'm doing with it. Or this is my opinion about it. I would recognize you that way. But until the trolls went and started messing with him and his wife, unfortunately, harassing him, that moment where I could sit down with him and say, hey, look, you were very inspirational to me when I was a young man. You were a catalyst to, to cause me to go in and look for shit that is off the beaten trail. and." For someone that says, there isn't those them guys did it to us guys again. There's, there isn't these people out there just going after your stop. And I've said this publicly and not to be disrespectful, but he's fucking wrong. Okay. There, there's absolutely, there's an entity out there that does that. Okay. And you're hearing it. So the point is, he inspired me to dig into things on a very deep and technical, well, pursuit. And I learned how to really call the highs and the lows of the day. Where when you think about like when we were younger, 
back in the the 90s. And, and I'm saying that, man, some of you probably are listening and they're older to me and, and have, have traded using pivot numbers and shit like that. And you're laughing yourself. <laughs> I was using that shit too back in the day. But it wasn't really consistent with giving you the high and the low of the day. Usually you get one or two of the levels be hit and that would be it. Usually the one level S1 or S2, the support level, one of them would be real close to the low of the day. Sometimes. And then other times it wouldn't be anywhere around it. So I was really never satisfied with that. I believed as a young man, once I started digging into the data and started seeing shit, I'm like, okay, this keeps repeating. I see this. Like I fucking see this thing. Okay. This little thing that I called and dubbed the fair value gap. It's much like when, well, it was my nephew. No, not my nephew, my cousin, Aaron, my uncle Stan's son. When I sat there and watched him coming up and he used to read these little highlight books, they're called highlight. And it's kind of like a children's activity book. They would be mailed to your house every month. And in one page out of this book, I like to get it before he did, before he came home from school, I'd already look at it and I wouldn't mark it up, but I would look at it because there's a page in there that is a hidden picture book. And what it is, is these little things. It's like a, sometimes I'll draw a cup or a candlestick, a literal candlestick, not a chart, not a chart. Like we look at candlesticks or um, a shoe or a needle or something like that. And they hide that picture inside of a picture. So I've always been into shit like that. Like I look for that kind of stuff. I'm analytical. I'm looking for patterns within patterns. I'm looking for, you know, shit that isn't typical. A puzzle. So when I started looking at price action, I was convinced that if I looked at it hard enough, studied it long enough, and turned every fucking thing that I've ever learned as a retail-minded trader, the shit that we're told to look for, what would be the fucking opposite of that? An indicator that tells you what? If it's saying it's overbought, and retail is going to say it's time to look for bearish divergence and it's going to go lower. Well, shit, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to look for a drop down into a fair value gap when it does that. And then I'm going to buy that motherfucker and I'm going to reach for buy side liquidity because that's exactly how I lost my ass in my real accounts as a 20 year old. That shit. Don't believe me. Go on your fucking charts. I'm not going to repeat it. You can rewind this when you listen to it in somebody else's YouTube channel because I don't put these up on my YouTube channel. I cuss too much. <laughs> it's therapy, okay? I don't give a shit. You can make out revenue off of this. You don't, do not put my videos. And it's a, it's a guy out there right now. Let me just say it right now. There's a guy out there that's taking my videos. I'm about to rip your shit down off of YouTube. You're taking my videos and you're trying to compress all the talking points out of it and just get to the nuts and bolts. And I'm about to put a copyright strike against you. You know who you are, so take them off your channel and there won't be a copyright strike. I don't let anybody take my videos and re-upload them. I don't want you to do that. You've not been given permission to do that. Don't do it. But these Twitter spaces, I don't give a fuck how many of you do it. I don't care. I will never put them on my channel. So if you want to monetize them, you want to get grocery money off of it, God bless you. Go do what you want to do with it. I don't care. So, but... I got these old bones cracking. I set out to look for these repeating phenomena in price. And I started seeing these things in, at the time I was looking at open, high, low and close bars. So that really puts a big strain on one's eyes. And I was never really early on a fan of candlesticks. Cause I thought it was like a cop out. Like this is like, preschool who the fuck wants to look at that a real chartist looks at the left tick which is the opening price one single line up or down which is the open high i'm sorry the high and low and then the right tick to the vertical line that creates the high and low that's the closing price so it's open high low and close so i i put off using candlesticks for a long time i wish i would have done it sooner my vision probably would have been spared a whole lot of fatigue over the years looking at that shit but I was looking at fair value gaps through the lens of the open, high, low, and close bar. It looks a little bit different. You got to really look at the ticks on that little tiny 
vertical line that makes up the the bar interval, whatever the time frame you're looking at. And there was charting packages that sometimes didn't have the closing price. It just gave you, I'm sorry, the opening price. It would just give you the high and low and a close. So we didn't have all the benefits. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, okay? Why would some charting packages, some charting platforms, not show you an opening tick? Think about that. That was a fucking clue to me. I'm like, why? Why isn't this showing an opening tick? It just gives me the high and the low and the closing price. What the fuck? Where's the opening price at? Where do we start trading at? And it made me think that they're hiding something. The conspiracy theorist in me started thinking, okay, they're not sharing that. So what the fuck's up? Just like the commitment of traders report. We used to have to get that like every two weeks. And then it became an every week thing. But we still had to wait. It was a delay. It was a delay. It was a delay. And we had to wait for the volume numbers, what the real volume number was for the previous day's trading. We had to wait a day later. Why can't you have the fucking data today? Like, why can't you have that today? It was all these, these, these delays. See, you're right now, you're fucking spoiled rotten and you don't even realize it because you have all of this information right in this little thing that I'm talking into right now, this stupid fucking cell phone. You have the world at your fingertips. Swipe here, click here, boom, boom, boom. Open up an app. You got information immediately that we did not have in the 90s and for folks that were trading before me. They didn't have it. Dinosaurs. We were fucking dinosaurs running around printing out the little tick. We had to guess on the chart. When we did our charts, we fucking wrote that little line, squiggly bullshit, on a graph paper. We, we guessed, okay, this is about where the opening price would be here in relationship to where we closed yesterday. There's no fucking measurement perfectly doing it. It's just eyeballing it. You know, the folks that's been around for a long time, Ken Roberts bullshit. <laughs> we had to update our charts by hand. And some of you are so fucking impatient and entitlement minded. You can't even appreciate the level of technology you have today that I know I didn't have when I first started. So you can't track 20 motherfucking markets if you're doing the chart by hand each day. You'll never get anything done. And we updated what? Our stochastic indicator. Yeah. All that shit had to be done by fucking hand. Calculation. Okay. This is where the, this is where the average would be here. The, the D line and the K line. And this is where they would be. Yeah, man. That's how it fucking was. It's worse than your grandfather walking to fucking school and the store with no fucking socks on and flip flops and knee deep fucking snow. You heard the stories too. I had, everybody hears the bullshit, right? <laughs> but in trading, this is the really real shit. This is how it was. It was some archaic fucking shit that we had to deal with. And data was a premium commodity. If you could get your hands on data, that's what we were pursuing all the time. And I poured myself into that. And I started seeing these things repeating by reversing everything that retail would expect every trader using it would be doing. Just because an indicator says it's over fucking bought does not mean that's a short. Just because it's overbought and then it diverges bearishly doesn't mean it's a short. Even when the market's going down, it doesn't mean shit. Doesn't mean anything. It just means that you looked at a number of candles in that interval of time. You crunched the numbers. You beat the shit out of the data. And you finally made it submit to whatever output you want. That's what indicators do. That's all it does. And when you hear somebody say, we're optimizing our, uh, your bullshit, your form fitting is what you're doing. There's no optimization. It's form fitting. That's what you're fucking doing. So when I looked at data and I looked at times where everything in my rules using retail bullshit said, okay, this is a buy. 
at that moment, I stopped, turned everything upside down, and I would go into the price action and say, okay, where is the fucking short? What things keep fucking repeating that cause this market to tear my ass up and go the other direction? And then it appeared. Order block. Breaker. Mitigation block. Fair value gap. Institutional order flow entry drill. What you know is the flagship, or no, it's probably not the flagship pattern anymore on my channel, but the optimal trade entry. That logic, I saw that formed on a, uh, on a corn chart. The, the, the very thing that I looked for I'm sorry, I, I, that's not true. I'm thinking of the reflection pattern. Reflection is the reverse of the optimal trade entry, where it makes the higher high. It usually forms the breaker. And some of you are like, oh, what did you just say? A reflection pattern. <laughs> that's some old school shit, man. But those patterns, they were found by looking at shit opposite to what we're told to do. And you see when I'm executing. Just just read the comments. It's fun reading it. I love it because they're like, how the fuck is he doing that? Right. And that's exactly what I was saying to myself. How the fuck am I losing all the time? I bought all these books. I'm following every fucking rule these guys are saying. And every fucking time I do this, it's going against me. How the fuck is that possible, right? That's, that, that's, that's what... Most of us would think if you're trying to stay in this, the smartest people are the ones that know they can't do this and they stop. That, that's that's wisdom. That's not that's not weakness. Because if you know you can't do this, you want to know as soon as you possibly can come to that conclusion. So that way you don't waste any more money, no more time, and no more peace of mind. But if you listen to things like I'm doing right here, you're a fucking traitor. Nobody would listen to somebody bloviate like this unless they absolutely fucking love trading. They love everything about it. They love the analysis. They love the lifestyle. They love every detail, everything that makes up this industry and what it is. You live and breathe it. You don't really like me. You just like the fucking shit that I'm sharing with you because it's empowering. You know a superpower when you fucking see it. And that's what I'm sharing. I'm teaching you how not to be a victim to fucking retail kryptonite. This Superman ain't got no fucking concern or worry about retail bullshit. That's never going to beat this. And because this is the market, that's why I tell you all the time, don't be fearful. Because this market wizardry is going to keep on fucking rolling. even. If people come up and say, oh, well, you know, everybody's doing this now. You're becoming the new retail. No, because there's a new round of suckers coming into this that don't know what they're doing. And they're buying all the bullshit. They're buying harmonic pattern courses. They're looking at bullshit they call harmonic algorithmic horse shit. And they loses their fucking money. You put that against something like this. This is beating its fucking ass. Day in, day out, month after month, year after year, the data doesn't fucking lie. Period. Receipts every fucking day. Every fucking day. Proof. Precision. Foresight. It's all being shown to you. You cannot fake this. You can't fucking Mickey Mouse it. It's 100% in your fucking face. You can't hide from it. And why people want to wrestle with it. And it's like, oh, well, you know, this, is, this is a fad right now. I guarantee you, they're going to talk about this shit even when I'm gone. When I'm no longer among you, <laughs> okay, they're going to talk about this stuff. It's changed everything. And you watched it. You're part of it. That's exciting. Like you were here when this shit happened. You're living in a fucking GAN moment. Think about that. Like you're here. That's not an inflated egotistical thing to say. I'm not, it has nothing to do with me. 
It has nothing to do with me. It's this phenomenon, this approach to deciphering price, reading it, forecasting it, and engaging it on a level of precision that is unfucking rivaled. Period. I don't give a fuck who you like, who you love, who you supported, who's taught you how to fucking trade. There isn't a motherfucker walking around on this spinning rock that can come close to this fucking level of precision. And I'm standing out here on fucking Twitter waiting. And ain't nobody coming here doing shit. So yes, yes, indeed, I'm in fucking enjoying myself. I'm loving it. I am having such a fucking wonderful fucking time. I got a fucking hard on every fucking day of the week when I'm out here with y'all. Because you want to know why? Because there's a little bitch down Texas that can't fucking step. And I'm waiting, Vinny. Bring your bitch ass. Let's go. Stop leaving stupid fucking voicemails on my fucking phone. Nobody's blocked you, bitch. Nobody's blocked you. You are fucking a bitch. Get on that fucking leaderboard so I can light your ass on fucking fire. You will be famous. I guarantee you, you'll be fucking famous. Everybody will remember your fucking bitch ass as the failure that never could. So please, please, buddy, bring your fucking shit. I will grind your ass to fucking powder and then light your shit up. Come on. Come on out there in the real fucking world in a real competition. Because I am showing you, you can't come close. I'm playing with you still. I'm baiting your fucking ass. Please let me show the world how much of a fucking fraud, unprofitable little bitch that you really are. Please let me. You should have already been on that fucking leaderboard. But you can't. You can't do it. And all these little fucking sock puppet accounts that you have that I'm talking to and you think I don't know I'm talking to you, I know I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah, I know it's you. And you're scared. I ain't scared. I can say your fucking name every fucking day. I don't give a fuck. Ain't nobody worried about you. Nobody wants your fucking algo box. Nobody thinks it fucking works and we've already seen you shit yourself. And you had one profitable day, one max loss, max loss, max loss. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what do you see ICT doing? Calling the fucking shots every fucking day. And I'm not even bringing out my heavy hitting shit yet. You fucked with the wrong one. Bring your bullshit lawsuit, motherfucker, because I'm going to tear your fucking ass up in court, and I'm going to reverse that motherfucking shit, and I'm going to put your ass up in the annals of fucking history as the biggest fucking clown that ever fucked with me and my fucking family, because I'm going to tear your shit up. You think silence is weakness, bitch? I'm fucking waiting. Don't send me no voicemails or some Mickey Mouse shit. Just bring it. I'm ready for your ass. I am fucking ready for you, fucking clown. Had to get that off my chest. Little bitch sends me a voicemail like I'm supposed to be scared. Motherfucker, please. You can't even fucking trade. So I'm looking for details in price action that tells me with a high degree of precision that I am absolutely in a, in a moment, in an instant where there is an arm wrestling match be between people like Algo Box, retail shit. Harmonic this and moving average horse shit. Golden crosses. That's all dumb shit. Proof. Look at his live streams. You'll see it fails. It fucking fails. It's not precise. He'll show you shit after the fact. I'm calling it live. Minute by fucking minute. Hello. That shit is the real poison. That's the stuff that you're going to fall victim to trying to trade with. And when there's an arm wrestling match between what real algorithmic theory and price delivery, which is what I'm teaching you, when that is up against anything else, the anything else is fucking losing. Have you ever seen 
Have you ever fucking seen? Now, this is nothing about me. Take me out of the equation, okay? Because I'm sure this sounds like a, a chest beating thing. The only thing I'm beating my chest is I'm ready for this fucking competition, bitch. Please bring your shit. You're supposed to be in there. If you don't fucking join that fucking leaderboard and fucking win it, Vinny, you've already said you're in it. So everybody's going to say you've blown your account. You're on the hook, bitch. You better do it. You better do it. Because you have now co-signed. You've done it. Why aren't you in there? I'll trade, I'll trade, I'll trade. There's real traders up there doing that shit right now. You ain't stepping into that world because you can't fake it. You can't reset your simulator account. You can't hide your bullshit stats. It's out there for everybody. And I'm out here without a safety net. I'm calling this shit. Oh, but you're not pushing a button. I don't need to. I'm giving you every fucking tick before it happens. You can't come close to this with anything. Any of you. Not one of you out there can come close to this. But have you ever seen anybody share a level of consistency, precision, and theory that repeats every motherfucking day? Have you ever seen it before? Because that's what market wizardry looks like. That's what it looks like. You're handling it. You're seeing it. You're seeing fucking proof of it every single fucking day. And I'm choking these motherfucking bitches that had all this shit to talk about before I came back to Twitter. I told you I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I can trade better than you. Show me. Oh, my Velcro balls just dropped off. Sorry. I'll talk to you again when I have something else to say in the response, but I can't show you my trades. I'll show you my trades. I'll show you my trades one day. The fuck out of here. It's clownery. Everything else is nonsense. It's fucking bullshit. These people's egos are fucking crushed. You're learning how to do what these motherfuckers never imagined was possible. And they can't stand it. And that should give you a fucking sense of satisfaction alone because they see you leaving the ranks of retail theory and dumb bullshit that has no real reason for making the price go up and down. Your indicators, there's moving averages, anything harmonic, none of that pushes price up or down. It's not having any effect on fucking the price movement. It's doing nothing. Has absolutely no fucking clue that that shit even exists. It's not referring to any of it. But isn't it fucking strange? Isn't it odd that the things that I'm showing you, I even gave you the fucking chart before the week even started trading. Here you go. Here's the new week opening gaps. Have this on your chart. And then I shared it before I started this stream tonight. <laughs> That's what you want your floor pivot numbers to look like. But they don't do that, do they? Oh, shit. This is the kind of fucking stream. This is the kind of fucking space that gets you fucking fired the fuck up. Because it's proof. It's fucking evidence. And it's undeniable. And ain't a motherfucker out there can say anything about it. They can come around and they can tweet and they can say all the bullshit. Oh, but you didn't do this, ICT. But you didn't do this. I ain't seen a motherfucker call it tick by tick like I'm doing. Ever. It's never happened before. <laughs> and I told you all. I could do this shit. But here's the thing. Guess what it doesn't do? It doesn't make you a better trader. And that's why I never had to fucking do it. Because if it would have made you a better trader, I would have done it. I'm out here stunting every fucking day to show this little bitch down in Texas he got nothing on me. And everybody that's ever supported him, Tom Dante, oh, Vinny's going to take on ICT. Bitch, please. There ain't no competition. All of you that ever had said anything about me, come together. I will beat your cumulative fucking returns in that fucking Robin's Cup or I'll delete my fucking YouTube channel. How about that, bitch? How about that? Catch me outside, bitch. How about that? Now, is that confidence for you? Because I guarantee you bitches can't do shit. Now, I'm all in, bitch. Let's go. Let's fucking go. Let's fucking show the world who the fuck knows what and who can do what. <laughs> Call my bluff, motherfuckers. Try it. Mickey Mouse bitches. Market wizardry is what you're seeing. You're seeing a level of technical fucking science that, yes, 
It absolutely feels overcomplicated. It feels like that because you're learning a language. You're learning a language that you've never been exposed to. None of you have been. Not one of you have ever seen this before. You see a rectangle, you think it's supply and demand. No. You see me talk about a specific candle. Oh, that's a supply and demand zone. No, it's not. That's a change in the state of delivery. Where that candle's opening is, that is, that is the change in the state of delivery. And there's three reference points. There's three specific price levels that you need to know about on order block. Look at supply and demand zones. Who the fuck knows what you're going to do with that? Where's your price? What price are you going to look at? Which one are you not going to consider at all, ever? That's how you know my theory is not supply and demand. And I'm cutting through candles. I'm telling you the high tick and the low tick of the day. I'm telling you the moment when the volatility is going to come into the marketplace and start running towards the objectives I've already given you. That's what market wizardry looks like. That's what it looks like when somebody knows what the fuck they're doing. Today, I recorded something that you would have never seen if I didn't want you to see it. If I didn't want you to see it, you never would have saw any of it. But I want you to see it. You saw me put the trade on. I told you the level. I said it goes to 4,000, I think 4,000.75. I said, it kills the, the short idea. Whenever I tell you that, that's a stop loss area. That's not me telling you to take a trade now, but I want you to track the, the ideas that I'm giving you. If it goes back to those levels, you got to think about it as, okay, that would be a stop out. You shouldn't have a trade on. You shouldn't do that. But it went to it and stopped me out. But when it hit it, it returned back into the range that I would consider still worthy to take the trade. And that was a that was a run on liquidity. I in that moment, in that instance, I was liquidity. It took my balance of the open position. I had already took a partial off and it came back and stopped me out. No problem. Didn't skip a beat. Okay, check. Everything's good. I'm going back in. You're gonna see me do that and reverse. When in, I see something, okay, this no longer is valid. Something else has changed. And now I'm going to go the other direction. Well, guess what? You can only learn that by experience, seeing it. And when I'm calling every individual PD array, when I'm talking about specific pools of liquidity, you're measuring the algorithm's interest in getting to that level or not. If I like a buy side liquidity pool, I'm watching it. If I say this is the draw on liquidity, then that's directional. If I say note this buy side, that means we're watching to see, does it have an interest to get up there? Once it gets there, then the insight that we get after it hits that then it'll give me the next idea about what I want to do. I'm waiting for more information. So please, motherfuckers, okay? Stop coming into my fucking comment section and replying, talking about, oh, well, he's calling this and he wasn't really sure about this. I know exactly what the fuck I'm looking for. I know exactly what I'm looking for. But I'm also teaching you how it is I'm interpreting every single price fluctuation, every pool of liquidity, every inefficiency. I'm looking at those very specific points in price action. And I'm waiting for price to get to that level. If I say the words, this is object, this is the objective, or this is the draw on liquidity, that's absolutely one fucking sided. That's where I'm expecting it to go. You seen me physically say those things in my tweets today. You saw that happen. They were not ambiguous. I favor the short side going down into 3988. That is one way that is not, well, it could be either way. Bullshit. 
I know exactly what I'm looking for, and I'm communicating it effectively for those that are fucking able to read and comprehend what I'm saying. If you're pushing buttons, taking trades, you're going to look at, oh, well, you know, he, he said this, and I got confused. You didn't get fucking confused. You're impulsive, and you want to push a button and trade because you think you're hearing signals. You think you're hearing a little nudge by ICT to get in and do that. No, don't do that. Don't do that. You're going to fall victim to impulsive pushing the button type responses like everybody else does. That's not market wizardry. That's not knowing exactly what the fuck you're doing. It has nothing. It's nowhere near that. You're emotionally gambling. Because you're looking for something to make you feel better about what you're doing. Whereas a trader, when we go in and we speculate, we don't care how the outcome is going to make us look to other people because we're not trying to share our results with other people. So guess what that means? Image has nothing to do with it. But you're trading a social media equity curve. Like everybody out there trying to be an influencer. I'm an influencer that can't wait to stop influencing. Like, I can't wait to be done in November. I can't wait. Then I'm, you're going to see me step back again. Everything they've ever said about me, I've proven it's bullshit. Making millions of dollars teaching, I'll stop at my height. There ain't nobody saying I can't open up a mentorship right now. I can do that motherfucker if I want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. And you should be thankful that I don't want to. I'm not building a, a brand where I can do affiliate with these funded accounts. Fuck these funded account people. I don't, I don't give a fuck. I don't have na- no interest in it. My son wants to do it. I wish he never would have brought it up, but he wants to do it. Okay, great. I'm not going to have no affiliate link getting some kind of fucking money off of it. Fuck all that bullshit. No signal services, no mentorship, join my group bullshit, none of that stuff. I'm pouring everything into you this year. And all you have to do is show up every day. You'll see receipts. You'll see proof that it works. I'll call it beforehand. It'll be fucking clear as fucking day by the end of this year. You'll know exactly what the fuck you're doing. Now, let me explain something to you. This this topic tonight. You're not going to be a market wizard in November. That's not going to happen. What you're going to know in November, so that way you have a real clear understanding about what you're working towards. What's the end goal for you? What is the end goal for all of you that submit to everything I put you through? What is that? It is that you will confidently know when not to do anything and be still and know that there's no reason for you to be worrying about missing anything. That's the number one thing right there. That in itself will protect majority of you from blowing out your funded account or blowing your regular trading account. Everybody that blows their account always can see it in hindsight that they pushed really, really hard when the market wasn't doing shit. You have an outcome that you need to have happen on a social media equity curve. You need to make yourself feel better because your spouse or your significant other has caused you some grief. You're sick. You missed some days at work. You're behind in bills or you're just in debt. What's it going to do? It's going to cause you to do reckless bullshit. You're going to know not to do that in by November, well, before that, really. But by November, you'll know when not to do anything. You'll know when not to touch any of that stuff. You won't go into the marketplace. You won't do these things. And you'll know what you're specifically looking for when you're going in in environments where it's low resistance. You'll know exactly what constitutes a high resistance or low resistance climate that you're trading in. You can trade in high resistance, but you'll also know that you'll be using far less leverage. And you're going to have to demand a whole lot of patience that you would otherwise not require when you're trading in low resistance liquidity run. Where the market's really quickly running for you, it goes right to your objectives. That's what you're wanting to focus on. You want to focus on those, those types of setups. They're fun. They're 
they're easy to know when they're going to be there because those signatures are like they're very telling. And you see it when I talk about it in my executions, I'll say, all right, I'm looking for a lot of movement or I'll tweet and say, OK, I want to see it be a straight run into this now. That's a low resistance liquidity run. When we are quiet and we're waiting for price to just chew through some old market structure, that's high resistance. It's high resistance. It's not moving quickly and efficiently through and to your objective. So it takes a different type of mindset to go through that. Now, when you are first learning how to trade, you think that all trades are going to be like a low resistance liquidity run where you get in. It runs because it owes you something, right? It owes you that profit. The fucking market doesn't owe you shit. It doesn't owe me anything. But these books and influencers make you feel like, well, hey, you know, you sat down, you watched that chart for the last 20 minutes. You, you damn well better play, pay me something, you know, because, uh, you know, it owes me something. That's the mentality, especially today. The last 25 years, this is the mindset of most everybody. You owe me. You owe me. No, you have to earn that shit. And by dis discerning the difference between high resistance and low resistance liquidity runs, you'll be able to effectively trade and you'll grow to appreciate and want to trade more so in low resistance liquidity run signatures where the market just quickly just runs, it has these really nice big candles. It just takes off and goes right where you want it to go. I know how to teach that. I prove to you that I can see it happening before it happens. There's a logic there. That's what you're going to know come November. You'll know that. You will absolutely know it. Will you lose in some of your trades? Sure you will. You'll lose, and there's nothing wrong with losing. Because money management, which we'll talk about also this year, will prevent you from blowing up. You don't have to be fearful of it. You don't have to worry about missing moves. You don't have to be in every trade. And you don't have to be in every market. You can pick one market that you feel confident in, that you like. And then that's all you need. It makes it so much easier. You know what those key levels are. Think about what I'm teaching you. New week opening gaps. New day opening gaps. Just that alone. And the enormity, enormity, <laughs> I'm making up shit as I go along, enormity, the enormous responsibility of managing all that shit on your chart and templates because new day opening gaps, you know, there could be a lot of them, right? So how much of that can you do if you're trading 12 pairs? Well, wait a minute, ICT, what, what if there's no, no new week opening gap? Um, here's what you're not doing. When you look at Aussie dollar, this is the part where you write down in your, in your journal. If you look at Aussie dollar, that currency pair has what? It has a commodity currency in it, Australian dollar, which means it trades on the futures market. That futures contract is going to have an opening gap. You use the price on the futures market and you use that in reference to what the pair is doing while the futures contract is printing too. I was teaching you with real-time examples this week and last where I'm using intermarket relationships and intra-market relationships. So I'm blending other assets, positively and negatively correlated Markets, how they influence each other and how they dance together. All those things come together and give you a tapestry that you can really see everything. For the life of me, I can't remember which one it was. There was a Batman, Chris Nolan. I think it was uh, It was the last one where he was doing uh, Morgan Freeman. Did something with the cell phone and all of a sudden all the monitors in front of him was like giving like a uh, like an x-ray view of some shit, okay? That's kind of like what this feels like. It feels like that. To, to put it like a little bit of a, um, 
a cinematic flair on it. When you're able to see behind price what it's likely to do. Think about it. when I first introduced the idea last week or so, I said, you want to look at the opening price on Sunday and the closing price on Friday. And then split that range in half and also do it in quadrants. So you have a number of specific price levels. I also taught you that if it works towards just half that lower end and fails to go in the upper end of it, that means it's what? Decidedly weak. And vice versa, if it's coming down, it can only dig into the upper portion of it and not get to consequent encroachment, which is the midpoint. That means it's bullish. By itself, that doesn't mean anything. But if you have a narrative that you think the market's going to go higher or lower and you see that unfolding, it gives you a real advantage. It also teaches you if we're moving away from the new week opening gap, then we're probably in a trending model which is what I talked about yesterday, real time. I told you we're going to have a large range day. We got a large range day. You can't fake it. It's there, real time, explained to you. And you have a whole year of this shit coming. Which led me to how I was going to close this session tonight with you. I have a lot of weapons. I have a lot of tools concepts, approaches, I literally could make a trading model every day of the week for each month of this year. And none of them would be the same. And I'd still have shit in the cookie jar. I spent my entire life coming up with every possible fucking scenario to get me into the trades. So yes, when you see these dickheads out there talking shit, I see he's always got something. He's just, this is the reason why you can justify that trade. You're fucking right. Because I was afraid to get in the trades. I was afraid I had a weakness as a trader. I didn't know what strategy to use to get in because every time I used retail shit, it was fucking failing me. Everything I tried, it failed. Steve Nilsson's fucking candlestick book. Garbage didn't fucking help me do shit, but lose more money. Elliot Wave tried that shit, lost fucking money there too. And I didn't try it for a week, folks. I was doing this for a long fucking time. Six months minimum before I made any fucking changes. And I was doing things religiously. Nobody puts in the work like I do. Nobody does. Nobody puts in this type of work ethic in this. And when I was younger and I had more energy, every waking moment was this. It was this. I lived and breathed this shit. Markets and price, it's in my fucking DNA. I was made for this. This is my purpose. This is why I'm on this fucking rock. I'm talking to you. This was appointed for us to meet. You know damn well what you're learning is going to change every fucking thing before meeting me. You know it. That's why you're still listening. That's why you put up with my fucking shit all the time. Yeah, you know I'm chemically imbalanced, but you know what? Every motherfucker out there that had fucking genius behind them, there was something different about it. They were wired differently. That's what I believe I am. It is what it is, but if I didn't look at things the way I look at them, I never would have been curious. I never would have pursued it. These obsessive compulsive things that I was birthed with that were a problem for me to wrestle with when I was a child, I channeled that shit into this stuff. And when I finally understood how these markets book, I had a mission. How do I bridge that gap that you're not supposed to see and how I can communicate in a chart the things that don't exist in books that other traders and teachers don't know anything about? Because believe me, folks, listen, they can talk all the shit they want now that it's growing in popularity. But if anybody knew this beforehand, 
it would have been out there. It would have been out there, and you know damn fucking well it would have been out there. And everybody that hears these people, and it's a small little people, some number of it, oh, ICT's renaming bullshit. Dude, you got $2.5 million in your fucking account. As soon as you give a complete rundown, a bibliography, where everything came from, what's renamed, and everything. And I guarantee you, you ain't getting it done. It's not happening. Sorry, but it just doesn't exist. BC, before this whole approach of looking at technical science, <laughs> the, the, the take the name that uh, Anton Creole mentioned in a little video, it's not technical science. It's just trading. No, 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 no. It's absolutely fucking technical science. There is a science behind all this shit. When the daily high and low is calculated at midnight every fucking day for every fucking market, unless there's a manual intervention, that's fucking science, okay? That's fucking science. You don't see the Goldman Sachs boys going out there and calling you where the fucking low of the day is going to be and the high of the day. You don't tell them. You know, they, they ain't out here telling you anything at intraday. They're going to tell you that it's noise. No, it ain't. This is fucking dubstep to me. Okay, this is fucking classics. This is this is Bach. This is Beethoven to me. It's fucking symphony. It's as beautiful. I see this shit as poetry. It's art to me. It's not fucking noise to uninitiated to the people outside this circle. It's fucking noise. It's a cult. Well, guess fucking what? I'm a proud card-carrying member of the fucking cult of winning, motherfuckers. If you got a problem with that, kiss my ass. I don't give a shit what none of you fucking think outside our circle. I don't give a fuck. And you think anybody that's doing well here gives a flying fuck what you think? <laughs> they don't give a shit. You ain't convincing them of anything. They're already in it. They've already tasted it. They've already seen it. They've already been convinced of it. And they keep getting new doses every fucking day. And that should encourage you because I'm telling you something. I fucking wish I had this. I wish I had this fucking community. I wish I was a member of a community like this. I wish there was a fucking ICT that I could have went to and learned this shit from. I wish I had what you have right now. I fucking wish it. I wasted so much fucking time and energy and money chasing bullshit. That promised market wizardry. And it was bullshit. None of their stuff ever worked. They couldn't prove that they could use it. You never seen anybody out there fucking doing what I'm doing. If I say I'm precise and I'm telling you to the tick, I better damn well fucking be able to do that, right? Well, guess fucking what? It keeps happening over and over and over again. That should be encouraging because you're in good hands. You're in good hands. You got somebody that gives a fuck how you're going to do with this. That's not charging you anything. There's no fucking coupon codes. There's no fucking Black Friday specials with me. Every fucking day is a Black Friday special. It's fucking free. Free. And I just want you to appreciate it. Because I could have been just like I was as a 20-year-old. Capricious. Not really knowing what the fuck I was going to do from one day to the next. And I could have went back on my word. If I was given this, I would spend the rest of my life teaching other people how to do it. If I was that same 20-year-old boy you thought he was a man. I would have said, no. It's just for me. But it wasn't given to me just for me. It was given to me so I could do what I'm doing with it.
So no, you're not going to be a market wizard in November. But you're going to know how to find setups. You're going to know how to engage in them. You're going to know how to place a stop loss and not be fearful of it. You're going to learn how to pyramid. You're going to be able to know what it is that you're waiting for and also what changes the, the, the lay of the land where you can't no longer take a trade in it. You have to sit on your hands and stop. And I'll teach you how to reverse it too. You're not going to know. Okay, and I want you to understand this. And please don't be upset. Okay. There's there's a measure of realistic expectations that you have to maintain. You will not be able to consistently do what you see me doing, nailing the low ticks and the high ticks. Like that that stuff takes long, long spans of time. There's so many things that I don't have the, the benefit of time to be able to pour into that just this year. It, it, wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be possible. But you don't need that, which is the reason why you see me taking partials, getting out really, really early, because I'm trying to condition you to do what? Be content with enough, which is why I told you what? Five handles. Do you see me trading with more than five handles? Of course you do. But I'm showing you that that five handles is a good starting point. And if that's all you ever get good at, you're killing most of what you see in retail out there because a lot of people can't be consistent. Here's the thing that drives me nuts. Okay. When I see other YouTubers and streamers out there doing this, I want them to sit down and contemplate what it is that they're doing and come up with one or two specific strategies that they know intimately. And this is what they're going to work with. And their audience will, number one, appreciate it because they'll recognize it as it's forming and they'll be probably doing the same thing that that YouTuber would be doing when it's time to take the trade on, right? By doing that, number one, it makes them a better trader. It makes them a wonderful medium to watch. And if they have a personality that's likable, and I like the people I said I like, they don't always rub everybody the same way. I, I like watching Patrick because I think he's funny. And I like the fact that he's brash about what he does. He looks and sounds a lot like I was when I was 20 years old. And I like trades by Matt. Humble guy. He ain't trying to fucking shake up the, you know, the hornet's nest with anything. He doesn't claim to be better than anybody else. And he's out there trying to find himself too. The other YouTubers, I'm not going to mention because I use them for the purposes of sentiment. So I don't want to build the case that someone would think of me as belittling them because I'm not. It's not even them that I'm looking at. It's their chat window and the excitement that their followers have when they think they see something in the marketplace. And no, I'm not going to tell you who that is. So don't ask me. Okay, it would be rude of me to do that, but when I'm telling you I like someone because I like them, I, I'm open about it. Like Hannah, Mon oh, Hannah Montana, listen to that. <laughs> like uh, Hannah FX, I said Hannah Montana because I was talking to my son Cameron about Miley Cyrus, and he was like, you know, she's she used to be on Disney. I'm like, uh, I don't know, and he was telling me, yeah, she did my Hannah Montana. So that, that's just where it came from. But there's a couple other YouTubers that you know I'm I'm watching come up. They're really, really new, and no, they're not students of mine. So it's not like, oh, you know, they're students, and you know, you're just afraid to share it. No, I, the, it's not always people that do what I do. Like I'm not closed-minded to the degree where, you know, I, I wouldn't give my time to someone else if if they're trading. Number one, and they're doing something that's noteworthy, not being a dickhead out there trying to be a clown. I'll I'll watch them. And if it's something I think is, is useful to observe and watch how they manage themselves, I share that with all of you as my community. And you can learn from other people how they engage the marketplace when they take a losing trade, which is extremely brave. Like to do that in a live stream and then you show your face. You can see and hear every mannerism. You're not looking at the back of somebody's head. You're seeing their mug, their face. You can read their eyes when they are feeling the weight of their stop getting ready to get hit. 
I mean, that's fucking courage. Okay, I don't care what the fuck you say. That is something that, in my opinion, it commands respect. Because you're not hiding anything. You're out there exposing it all. Matt does that. Patrick does that. And I have a great deal of respect for that. Sitting out there, showing your cards, playing the hand that you feel is dealt to you, and then walking that in front of everybody, win or lose. And that's, that's brass, man. It, it takes brass to do that. Some people just can't do it. You know, I can't allow myself to be in a condition where I'm going to influence the outcome of someone else's money because I can take a losing trade. It, it doesn't bother me. I mean, you watch me get stopped out. It wasn't a losing trade, but you watch me get stopped out and immediately, immediately checked everything. Everything's good. Okay, boom, I'm right back in. You wouldn't do that. If you followed every trade I was doing and you over leveraged on one and you know you would. I get stopped out. Okay. It's a mosquito bite to me. But for you, because you over leveraged it, because you're trying to do market wizardry, <laughs> you're trying to get out of your job, pull a hat trick and try to go into uh, early retirement on the heels of ICT streams. When I go into the next trade, which is nothing for me, You've done damage to yourself emotionally and financially. Now you are afraid of the outcome of the next trade. And you may have watched me do 98% success week after week, day after day. And then all of a sudden, now you had that one loss, which probably wasn't all that much. But because you over leveraged it, now it's monumental. You've now laced the outcome, the result of the next trade, now it's paramount that it must succeed. It has to succeed now because you're damaged goods. So I know the characteristics that we as humans usually do. We do it all the time. We act impulsively. That impulsive nature is exaggerated in someone like me because I'm imbalanced. So I know, <laughs> I know if I see something in the marketplace, I got no problem running up on a, a, a trade that would be 5% risk. And the fact that I'm in that type of trade would inspire you to do what? Well, shit, if it's good for him, it's good for me. I mean, he must really trust this trade and I might get stung. I'm not worried about coming back from 5%. 5%, I'm coming right back from that in 30 minutes. You don't have that. You don't have that skill. You don't have that confidence. You don't have the weapons I got. So I'm trying to be responsible because I know the influence I have and I'm trying to be a good steward with it. So what do I do? I walk you through the chart one candle at a time, showing you market wizardry, foresight, precision. It should do this. It shouldn't do that. It should do this. It should not do that. And the market just walks on a leash and delivers what we're looking for. Most times, not every time, most times. So when you're looking at what we're doing over the course of this year in closing, I'm going to say this and we're done. The idea of what you're going to be, you're not going to be a superhero. OK, you're not going to be a juggernaut, but you're going to be a fucking savage. And that's enough. You're going to know how to find setups that yield high probability results. That's not 100 percent perfect. It's high probability. That means you have every advantage in your favor that is most likely going to pan out for you exactly how it's been explained. And I could literally stand in the motherfucking courtrooms and do this in front of judges, juries, whatever the fuck you want to do. I'm doing it right now because I know it. It ain't going to fucking stop every week, every day, and it will not stop. Nothing's fucking changing except for it's going to be better. It's going to improve. Everything's going to be more seamless. Everything's going to become faster, folks. 
That's what that's the change that's coming. Everything is going to become faster and more streamlined. Data will be much more efficient. Latency will be reduced. It's only going to improve. Nothing's going to change adversely unless we're no longer allowed to trade. And that might be too Orwellian for some of you. But anything can happen. Anything can happen. And the more people that make their living or wealth doing this builds the likelihood of what? Being fucked with. So it's a matter of as long as it's going to be allowed for us to do it, it's going to work. And worrying about what if they take away the ability for us to trade. If you're worrying about that and not actively pursuing doing it, you're wasting your fucking time. It could be 20 years from now. It could be 10 years from now. What are you doing between now and then? Working? You're wasting your fucking life. This year is a divine appointment. You found this because it was destined for you to have this. You're seeing someone that I know. I know me. Okay, I know me. I know that there ain't a motherfucker out there that's going to pour into anybody like I'm pouring into you. You're not paying me for shit. And I'm proving it. Every day with precision, with the theory, the logic I'm teaching you. It's repeating. If it wasn't algorithmic, listen, folks, if it wasn't absolutely fucking controlled, there's no way, no fucking way that I would know what it's going to do minute by minute. Think about that. It takes more faith to believe in fucking Santa Claus. Than to believe that the market is algorithmic now. I mean, it's so obvious now. It should be fucking obvious. And why it's so such a divisive thing. Like you should be thankful. You should appreciate the fact that, hey, this is a big fucking weight off my back that, hey, it's not it's pure randomness. Because if it was really fucking random, how the fuck could you sleep at night knowing you're risking money? You think these these organizations out there that are risking billions of fucking dollars? Are doing it with the understanding that it's all fucking random, guys. <laughs> Who the fuck knows what's going to happen tomorrow? I mean, the market could, could go up anywhere. It could go down anywhere. But yet, that's the horse shit that you swallow down and think, oh, you know, they said it, so it must be true. Goldman Sachs says it's noise on these lower time frame charts. These people that go out there and they, they try to teach you the 401k approach to getting wealthy, they'll tell you nobody can time the market. We're fucking laughing at these motherfuckers. We're doing this every fucking day, every fucking session, every minute by minute. It's fucking predictable, folks. Okay. And you should literally be dancing around on a sugar fucking high because you're learning something that most people out there think that it's impossible to do. And it should be a fucking carnival experience every day with me because I'm showing you the fucking future. We're time traveling. Every fucking day we're time traveling. You're seeing the outcome of them fucking charts beforehand. That's like having tomorrow's winning lottery numbers every day. Think about that. Think about that. What the fuck? Seriously? That's what it feels like. It should be feeling like that for you because that's exactly what it felt like for me. In my later 20s, it dawned on me. It dawned on me that, oh, shit. I have the ability to be able to see the fucking future. And then it's that moment you start looking around and you're waiting for the fucking black helicopters to come fucking swarming in. The fucking men in black showing up. <laughs> it feels like that. And when you walk out there every day and you're able to see it and it's delivered into your hands every day. 
just like this. It's a it's a feeling that I cannot describe. When I asked that guy Corbs, I said, you know, because he asked, you know, why why does our community behave the way it does? Not all of you, but some of you that are really just fucking warriors. Like you just want to throw down because somebody said something that you didn't like about me or what you're learning or you or whatever. It's going to be like that all the time. There's going to be people talking shit all the time. You don't need to defend me. I'm out here doing it and nobody's keeping up with me. So just laugh at them. But when he said that, why does Mark, why does our community act the way it does? Like it, it, some of you would be willing to take a bullet for me, which is insane. Uh, the idea that you would represent me in any manner whatsoever, because you have a, a measure of respect for me that is beyond father. Okay. Bef beyond a parental uh, relationship. And I understand it. Like I understand that dynamic. But when I responded to him, I said, okay, try to explain to me, like I'm someone that's not a traitor. Okay. Try to do this to somebody else. And you've probably already done it. And they're never going to understand it like you feel it and experience it. But I asked Corbs in the interview, I said, explain to me in a way that you should feel satisfied. And I'm a lay person. That means I'm not someone that's versed in trading. I'm just somebody off the street. Just nobody ever sat down with me and talked about trading. And then boom, here you are. You're profitable. You just walked through the full week. You did everything right. All trades on par. You just, you were dialed in. Explain to me how you feel doing that. And he struggled to do it. And watching his face as he was reaching for words that would never come close to satisfying. And he doesn't even know what we're doing here. But he knows what it feels like to be on side, dialed in. You can't get any more dialed in than perfect. You can't improve on fucking perfect. To the fucking tick. How can you fucking improve on that? You can't. So why the fuck are you not elated that you exactly know where you are? What the fuck you're learning, where you're going with it, because I'm telling you, the sky is not the end. It's not the limit. This motherfucking opportunity is limitless. It's fucking limitless. You have no idea how far you're going to go. I guarantee you, you're thinking your high point is this. It ain't high enough. It ain't fucking high enough. It's going to be way beyond that. Fucking way beyond that. You just can't see it yet. Your vantage point isn't high enough for you to be able to see how far you're going to go with this. And that's why I want your story. I want to know what you've done with it. Because I am placing something in your hands that nobody can. That's real empowerment. That's fucking superpower. Like that is, you're, you're able to read the fucking future. Who the fuck wouldn't want that power? You know what's going to happen. You have an enemy. Okay, what's he going to do? You need to make money. What, where's the next thing to make money on? You don't want to lose money. So you want to protect your money. Okay, where, what do you don't want to do this? You don't want to invest here. You don't want to do that. That's empowerment. You're not going to be influenced like the mortals in retail that are always plagued with trying to get back what they just lost because they didn't know what the fuck to expect. Think about it. Everything that we do, folks, everything that we do is around an element of time. This is what time it should do this. You're setting your fucking watch to the, th the shit that we do in trades. You can set your fucking clocks in your home, at your work desk, on your wrist, on your fucking phone. Well, maybe not your phone. I think it's automatic now. But the point is, you can set all this shit like Swiss timepiece precision. We're not guessing when certain shit's going to happen. You don't see that in fucking retail anywhere. 
it's like, well, you know, <laughs> anything can happen. You got to be, you got to be in front of your charts when it's going to happen. If you miss it, you miss it. You know, that's how it is. You got to put it in the chart time because you don't know when these opportunities are going to present themselves. That's what every fucking book I ever purchased. That's the paint. That's the painting. That's the picture. That's the narrative they tried to put you into believing. And that's bullshit. That's grade A fucking bullshit. That's a lie. That's somebody that doesn't know what the fuck they're doing. That's what that is. And they're writing a book asking you to pay $60 and $35 and $40 for a bunch of bullshit. I wouldn't wipe my ass with that shit. It's useless. And the only reason why I don't throw the fucking books away is because they're sentimental to me. I worked very hard. Part-time jobs just to afford that bullshit. And for throwing it away would mean like, you know, I, I worked my ass off just to throw it away. Now, I wouldn't get enough satisfaction throwing it away. I like seeing those books and laughing at them. The writers of those fucking books and how clueless they fucking are. That's why I hold on to them. I hold on to none of them with any value that they're helping me continue being the person you see me as the analyst that I share and do everything in front of you live with the lectures that I teach from none of that stuff comes from those books. It's all regurgitated horseshit. That's the same stuff over and over again. That does not fucking work. But how do people make money with retail stuff? They're good money managers. Because remember, if you're a good money manager, you can flip a quarter and heads you're a buyer, tails you're a seller. Limit your losses, let your profits run. That's a winning strategy right there. Is it? it, it, it believe me, <laughs> just test it. Get, get $5 in pennies. Sit down over the weekend. Flip a quarter, okay? And move the pennies to uh, the other side of the, the table you're at. And that's your bet. And do that same thing over and over and over again. It's really hard to lose the, the money. It's really hard to do it. If you limit how much you're willing to bet and you allow for if you win, you get three pennies. If you lose, you lose one penny. And you just flip your quarter. Heads your buyer, tails your seller. Think about it like that. And you'll see, it's very hard to lose all of it. It's hard. It's not easy to do it. But you, as a retail trader, looking at that horse shit, going out there and rushing in to do it. I got my stochastic on there. I got my fucking CCI on there. My moving average golden crosses. Here it is. But you don't know how to manage money. You don't know how to manage yourself. None of these books adequately talk about that. Which is the reason why I beat the shit out of you with these types of lectures because that's the stuff that's going to undo you. You cannot be successful without knowing how to manage yourself. And believe me, I am chemically imbalanced. I'm going to tell you how important it is because it's fucking even worse for me. It's really difficult for me to balance and manage myself as an average day person, let alone a fucking speculator. Think, think, when you watch me do these live streams, that's not Ratchet ICT. That's me with all of my focus, with nobody asking me anything. There's no chat window I'm reading. I'm not looking at Twitter. I don't give a fuck about what questions are coming up, what anybody else is saying. It doesn't matter to me. The only thing that matters is that candle that's forming right now in front of me. And my attention is dialed the fuck in on that. I, it's three decades of conditioning for that. When I'm talking about price or if I'm talking about something biblical, faith-based, you're not going to hear Ratchet ICT come out. It's 100% dialed in. But when I'm in an environment like this where there's no filter, I'm sitting in my trading room, looking around at monitors that are off. I'm looking at my stereo and my speakers and TV and entertainment center over here and my, my towers that are underneath my trading desk. 
nothing's really drawing my attention. It's just I'm letting my mind go. And whatever's in the front gets to talk and say whatever it's whatever it wants to talk about, whatever, whatever point it's being made, it's this 100 percent 100 mile an hour. And it's not easy to track me. And it may be entertaining for some of you. I'm not trying to be entertaining. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be a comedian. But I'm trying to communicate to you that the things that you don't pay attention to, that you think that aren't important to you because you don't have that problem, it'll be easy for you once you start making money. You'll, you'll figure out how to manage making money. That's what you're thinking. You have no idea. Proof of that is when you start making real money. You're going to fucking short circuit right there. Most of you have no idea what it feels like to make good money. Because you've been conditioned all your life to make nothing. Give up your entire fucking day. Your entire week. Wear yourself the fuck out. For a little bit of money. Come home. Be tired. No energy. No time to do anything. You got to make sure you get eight hours of fucking sleep to go do it all over again. And then when you start making your monthly salary gross before taxes in one fucking trade, you're like, whoa, this was nice. Wow, this was, this was such a fortunate windfall. And then it repeats. And then you feel like, well, wait a minute. What am I doing to do that? I'm going to continuously do that. And then it becomes every week. And then it becomes every day. And then it becomes each session, morning and afternoon. That kind of windfall continuously, it changes you. It challenges you. And it's going to show you where your flaws are. As a young man, I was continuously looking for a way to find validation because I lost my grandfather. My father didn't raise me. And my mother didn't want anything to do with me. So I've always spent my entire life seeking validation. And when I got it from my grandfather as a father figure, I lost him due to pancreatic cancer. And I watched this strong, big Navy man get consumed and went down to 90 pounds. This man was 300 pounds and not a fat ass either. He was big, big ass shoulders, big ass fucking back, big ass fucking arms. So, I mean, he was a man. That motherfucker was looked. He looked like a fucking redwood, like he was a tree of a man. But I watched that disease consume him, and he looked like a shell. And when I lost him. I was lost because he was my strength. He was my direction in life. This was all before coming to Christ. I was literally clinging to him. He was the father figure that I needed. He was the, he was the discipline. He was the enforcer when he needed to correct my ass and put me on the right path. You're fucking off. Get your ass over and do this. Okay, done. Chores, I had them done. He never had to ask. And I remember asking him, I said, Pop, should I join the Navy? Because if he would have said join the Navy, I would have done it. Just to please him, just to get his approval. He said, no. No, 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 no. The country's not what it used to be. Nobody should do that now. When we were doing it, it was a different nation. It was a different way of doing it. But what they're doing now, no, don't do that. So I didn't. But I told him, I said, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Oh, we'll see it. That's what he said. We'll see it. 
that th- I didn't take that as, well, that ain't going to happen. Meaning, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to fucking do it. I'm not going to just talk about it. I'm going to fucking do it. If I'm going to do it, I won't talk about it. And I knew exactly what he meant. So I didn't talk about it. I set my ass to doing it. I was going to be a systems analyst. I was going to school for computer programming and information systems. And that was my goal. I wanted to be a systems analyst. I wanted to do all of that. In my schooling, I couldn't secure a job. So I was a coder since sixth grade by choice. I was making my own games in sixth grade. But that's not where I was supposed to be. I looked at things as an algorithm even before my sixth grade math teacher taught it to me. Everything was a process. Everything was managing if then. In my head, I managed my everyday living. If I act out on what I'm feeling, this is what's going to happen. Then I'll have to deal with that. It was always an internal dialogue in my mind, wrestling with bipolarism, wanting to act out, wanting to do things that I know I shouldn't do. And then feeling emotional and feeling embarrassed because I felt emotional and not understanding what that feels like wrestling with it. And you see these fucking assholes online, they make light of it. Like if you felt it, you wouldn't talk the way you do. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say those things because it's very difficult living with it. Very difficult. But as a younger guy at 20 years old, when you start seeing money come into your hands, that your uncle that went to University of Maryland has a business degree and he's working a fucking Kentucky Fried Chicken just to make ends meet, and you can see it on his face, he's ashamed. And then you, his nephew, pay for his school shoes, his clothes, and his entertainment because his father and mother can't do it. I'm glad I had that experience. Well, when I first did it, I felt off. I felt like I'm embarrassed to do it for my uncle. He didn't ask me to do it. I did it because they couldn't do it. If I didn't do it, my cousin Aaron would have been wearing the same shoes and the same clothes that he wore the previous school year. And you know how it is with kids. Oh, you're wearing the same old shit. They would have teased him. But apart from that, I was a dick. I was an arrogant motherfucker. And I threw it in everybody's face. I make more money. I pay more taxes in three months than your fucking whole family makes in a year. That's who you are listening to when I was 20. That's how I was. When you start making a lot of money, it's going to show you where your weaknesses are. So as a 20-year-old, when I said those things, what I was exhibiting was All the fucking pain I was carrying inside. And I was trying to deflect it and show it as an offense. I finally am able to do this. Fuck all of you. You're nothing. You're fucking piss ants. I make more money than your whole fucking family does. I pay more taxes than your whole family fucking earns in gross salary. That's the shit that came out of my mouth as a 20 year old. And I'm ashamed of having said those things and acting the way I did. But it manifests because I needed validation. When I was saying those things, I wasn't trying to hurt anybody's feelings by doing that. What I was wanting to actually have happen, and it was stupid, but this is what everybody does on social media. You think by taking your shit and look at my fucking cars, look at my shit, look at my fucking watch I paid too much money for, look at everything that I got. 
but you can't see them executing any fucking trades. But they're going to show you all this other shit. Look at my house. Look how rich I am. You're a poor fucking low IQ motherfucker. When you see that, you're seeing a weak man like I was at 20 years old. You're seeing a weak man projecting. And what they and what I wanted to hear was, you know what? That's fucking awesome. And if someone would have said that every time I did it, I would have probably broke down and started crying and saying, you know what? That was a fucking dick move. I should have never said that. And they would have given me what I really wanted. Validation. And that's what some of you are going into this with. You're looking to use these market wizardry concepts to make a lot of money, to make a name for yourself. So that way you can go out on social media and project your weaknesses, but you're going to do it in a way that you think it's an offense. You're going to really stick it to these people that really fucking made you feel insignificant. You want to crush them. You want to just make them feel stupid. They're never going to feel more stupid than they are. The fact that they even troll other people, that's the testimony that they're fucking idiots. Because if they were really making money, if they're really successful, they wouldn't be doing this shit. They wouldn't be hiding in people's fucking comment sections and on their fucking videos and making up dumb shit constantly. Spending more time with someone else, a grown 50-year-old man has more of their attention span than their own fucking wife and kids. Come on now. That's someone that's trying to compensate for something. And I was compensating for the lack of direction in my life when I was 20. I would have done anything to have anyone at that time because not one of my family members said I was going to be able to be successful at this. And when I started seeing success, they all turned their head and didn't want to acknowledge it. And it pissed me off. So what did I do? More of the bragging, more of the showboating, more of the buy cars, more to go on vacations, more of this, clothes, buy four hour pair of shoes. I get a muddy, throw them in the fucking trash right in front of my uncle. And he cussed me out and said, you're a stupid asshole. You have any idea how much money you just wasted there? I worked my ass off all fucking week long to make that after taxes, and you just fucking did that in front of me? I hear that in my fucking heart every time I think about that. That cut deep as fuck. I didn't throw those fucking shoes away to be a dick to him. I just figured, well, fuck it. I'll just go out and buy another pair of them. But because he saw me do something that was ridiculously stupid. I could have cleaned them. But in my mind, fuck it. I'll just buy another one. Another pair of shoes. Who gives a shit? Go to Nordstrom's. I'll buy some more shit. There it is. Done. But his, the look in his face when he talked about that, and then I watched that glassy like he was on the verge of so frustrated with me and ashamed of me the way I was acting. He emotionally said those things to me and it was like he kicked me in my solar plexus like I couldn't breathe. And while I did leave those shoes in the trash can, when he walked back in there, I waited for him to go upstairs and then I went in and now I'll go upstairs. I got cleaned up because I was renting a room from him. And I went outside, got the shoes, cleaned them up. I gave them to a friend. But I know he went out there the next morning before he left for work to make sure those shoes weren't in that trash can. Money is going to challenge and change you if you let it. And it will allow you to feel confident about being the wrong type of person. And I'm going to tell you this, and I've said it before, but I mean it. Every time when I was younger and I was trying to showboat and flash and talk down to other people, I never, I fucking never felt powerful doing it. I always felt like a piece of shit afterwards. I wished I could have went back in time and said nothing like that. But I was wrestling with a real need inside of me, and I didn't know how to manage me, so I acted out. I showed out, 
talked my shit, spent money stupidly, thinking that people would do what? Give me respect. And you know what they did? They played me. Everybody wanted to be my friend. Every girl wanted to sleep with me then because they knew what I was throwing around. And hey, all I got to do is tell this fucking idiot he's fucking cool and I can get in his wallet. There you go. And you young men think that that's not going to happen to you. And that's exactly what the fuck's going to happen because there's a woman out there and there's a man out there that's going to play your fucking ass like a fiddle because you're too wrapped up in your weaknesses that you're trying to hide because now you got money. You're going to try to use that money like it's a fucking sledgehammer. Smash everybody over the head. I'm better than you because look what I got. That doesn't make you better. It just means that you spent too much fucking money on the shit you got. That's all it means. Who's really fucking smart? These fucking people that are buying $300,000 fucking sports cars. That's fucking stupid. That's fucking dumb. Eight to ten years from now, none of us is going to be allowed to have a fucking combustible engine. So <laughs> who's going to be laughing then, right? So anyway. I just want to touch base with all of you and I want to decompress and get some perspective on what you've been in enduring, what you've been experiencing and what you're learning. And in concert with what I mentioned this morning about maybe not knowing how far you've grown because you don't know how to measure it yet. And your best testimony of your growth is your journal, the things that you're learning, you're observing. And we're only in, really into this now a couple of weeks. We haven't even done a full month yet. And I've already changed most of your perception about how price is booked by giving you two specific ranges of inefficiency where the market's going to constantly go back to and revert to it for the sake of fair value. And by understanding just that alone, Sets up all kinds of setups that you were not even aware for. And it repeats every week. It's going to be this repeat, repeating phenomenon that takes place. And you also know that every morning at that New York opening gap, the difference between where we closed yesterday and the 930 opening price. What happens if there isn't a gap there? You still reference the respective opening and close price. You have to have those levels. Those levels are going to be useful. The likelihood of you opening exactly where we closed, can it happen? Sure. Is it going to happen most times? No. And for Forex, you're going to use the futures market. Those Canadian dollar futures contracts, those Australian dollar contracts, the Japanese yen contracts, the British pound contracts. Those are going to provide you that gap that you're going to utilize. And when you're looking at the US 500, I know some of you are concerned about, well, I don't see this and I don't see that. Even though you can't trade the levels and the markets because your country won't let you trade the U.S. markets and you can only trade the CFDs. The very candles and time that you see me referring to in the futures contract, track as best as you can in those respective candles. The levels are never going to line up. It's never going to happen for you, which is why I've had a difficult time wrestling with that because I'm trying to, I'm trying to bridge that for you. And it's in many ways, much like what I was opening this conversation up with, how I looked at problems that Larry Williams and other traders said that they would have. I would go in and I would pursue that as a puzzle to figure out. And I'm, I'm wrestling with that right now. I'm trying to bridge the disconnect between what the US 500, the US 100, and the US 30 CFDs do and how they book with that of the actual 
U.S. futures market. So when we're not together, that's what I'm doing. Like I'm, I'm literally going through charts and trying to come up with a way where I can make this easier for you that can't trade the futures contract. I might not be successful, but I'm working my ass off to try to do it. And if I'm able to get to something where I think it's easy for everyone to understand using it, I'm going to teach it to you. I'm not going to hold it back. It's not going to be in the book. It's going to be in a lecture that I'm teaching real time over the charts. That way you can see it. But I can't dilute my attention because it's very easy for me to chase cars. It's it's very, I have a very hard time holding my concentration on any one particular thing. And the two things that hold my attention the best is anything that has to do with Christ or the markets. So if I'm, I'm watching a, a candlestick chart book, like you can hear it. Like I'm, my, my focus is 100%. I will not let anything else get in the front of my consciousness, which is what wrestling with bipolarism is like. Imagine you're in a room, okay? You're in a room with people you don't know. And they all have a question that they're asking you. And they're all asking at the same time. And you don't want to offend any of them. And you want to give them your undivided attention, but you can't. So you wrestle with the uncomfortable state that that makes it feel like for you because you want to give every one of those individuals that is asking you a question your undivided attention, your, your respect, your consideration. But you can't. That's what it's like being bipolar. I can't sometimes fight off these impulsive either responses or remarks or train of thoughts where I go off in a rabbit trail. I'll come back if you give enough time. I'll come right back to where I ended. And it drives my wife nuts. Like we've been together since 1997. And she's like, I still can't get over how you, you are talking. You're having five fucking conversations. Five conversations. You know exactly where the fuck you left off, but you go off on these other things and you didn't finish the shit you started over here. But if I don't stop you and it, it, you just go right back to doing it, and it's hard for me to follow you. But I can see you, you go back to it and you finish it because you don't want to leave anything undone. But I know how it is listening to me. And this is what I tried to hide from all of you because I'm emotional about it. I feel like it's a weakness to do that as an educator. And I understand some of you might say, well, you know, don't look at it like that. But it doesn't change the way I feel about it because I've wrestled with it all my life. So when I can talk in my best form, which has always been the recorded format, where I filtered out all of the imbalances when I'm swinging from you know, both sides of the spectrum. It's rare that I'm balanced for the short period of time where I can talk focused, not reach for the colorful language that invariably shows itself here. That's the, that's the mentor I've always strived to be. And that's the one I only wanted you to see which is why I did recording only. I knew if I was in a setting where if it was live, I would feel that way. And I was wrestling with that when I was doing private mentorship and I was trying to do live sessions. And I was wrestling with all of that right then and there with 860 some people all asking me very politely initially and then got more aggressive because I couldn't answer everybody at one time. And I still get people complaining to me. I sent you an email fucking nine months ago and nobody nobody responds to me you're an asshole you're a terrible mentor do you have any idea what it's like to get hundreds of fucking emails every hour who the fuck can do that nobody i would never get anything done like i would never get anything done just imagine <laughs> imagine a thousand tweets or not tweets but text messages came to you every day from different people and they all want a response as soon as they give it to you. Like they're the only person that exists. Like you're their 
you're they're there they are your only student and they're right to expect my attention but i'm human like i'm i'm not omnipresent like i i <laughs> i can only occupy one space at one time that's it so because i'm central to wherever i'm at right then and there and i'm not omnipresent i can't humanly answer everything like i can't do that like i feel guilty when you all give me support and feedback on twitter when i'm looking for it i literally will sit there and go through and read every single comment and i'm liking it so that way i i'm communicating to you that i gave you my time at that moment and i read your message and I want you to know I read it. So I, when I heard it, I read your message. Like I, I, I took time. I read what you said. If I like it, if I think it's impactful to me, if it moved me or if it's something for the community that I want to share, I thought was funny or it's helpful, then I'll retweet it. But I wear my heart on my sleeve as a mentor, which isn't good. That opens me up to criticisms that will invariably do what? Cause me to have an emotional response, which is typically fucking rage. <laughs> now, in all of the shit that's been said about me, I'm supposedly threatening people's family and threatening children and paying for people to fucking threaten them. I am perfectly capable of fucking threatening somebody on my own. I can do that, and I don't do those things. I've never had to do those things. It's not in my character. Even in my worst Bipolar fucking episodes. I've never fucking ever threatened anybody's fucking family. Nobody's children were ever threatened. And I sure as fuck did not pay anybody to do that. And for a man down in fucking Texas making a fucking narrative about this bullshit for fucking clout and attention. You're fucking stupid, dude. You're fucking stupid. And I hope you get in that courtroom and that motherfucker opens a fucking can of whoop ass on your fucking ass. And you're going to find out that nobody got paid by me to do any of that shit. I don't need to do that. You've done nothing to slow me down. You've done nothing to, to convince anybody learning this stuff that they're wasting their time. You're seeing all of these people growing in their understanding. You're seeing people fucking making money. They're bringing their fucking receipts. The companies that are paying them are interviewing them. So it's about time to shut the fuck up. And on that note, my friends, we're going to close this one, and I'm going to wish you all a very pleasant evening, morning, whatever it is, where you're at in your neck of the woods. And we'll be back at it again tomorrow with another carnival-like atmosphere, I'm sure, overpriced and candlesticks. I think that's about all for me. Till next time. Be safe.